You're listening to the OCD Stories podcast, hosted by me, Stuart Ralph. The OCD Stories is a podcast dedicated to raising awareness and understanding around obsessive compulsive symptoms. I do this through interviewing inspired therapists, psychologists, and people who have experienced OCD. Welcome to the OCD Stories. And welcome to episode 425, and in this one I got on Dr. Nicholas Farrell. Nick is a licensed clinical psychologist and clinical director of programming and development at NoCD. We discuss Nick's therapy journey, explaining ERP and its effectiveness, working on hierarchies that target the correct thing, home practice, ERP as a lifestyle, and much more. And thank you to NoCD for supporting the podcast. NoCD offers effective and convenient therapy available in the US and outside the US. To find out more about NoCD, their therapy plans, if they currently take your insurance, or to download their free app, head to go.treatmyocd.com forward slash the OCD stories, or the link will be in the episode description. Thank you to all of our patrons for supporting our work. To sign up to our Patreon and to check out the other benefits you'll receive as a patron, please see the link in the show notes. So thank you to Nick for his time. I appreciate it. And of course, thank you to you guys for listening. As always, it means a lot. And without further ado, here is Nick. Welcome to the show, Nick. Thank you so much, Stuart. I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, it's good to have you on. I appreciate you uh, you coming on. So um, I always ask therapists um, or psychologists, like, what, what are their therapy journeys? So it could be personal, but equally it could just be why you became a therapist and why you uh, specifically decided to work with OCD. Sure. Well, um my story is a long one. I don't know how, how far you want to get into it. Uh, I, I think it really began uh, as an undergraduate student where um, I actually uh, began by majoring in education. And um, whereas I didn't I didn't dislike it, um, I just wasn't able to feel passionate about it. And I happened almost by uh, by accident to be taking um, just an entry level psychology course. And that that is what um I felt passionate about and interested me. So mm-hmm. it didn't take much time for me to switch majors and focus my attention on studying psychology. Um, really enjoyed the coursework throughout throughout university. And as I was nearing uh, the, the end of that journey and starting to look for work, um, I was fortunate enough to find work at uh, a large hospital-based system uh, in the United States that uh, offered great training uh, and experience uh, working in primarily higher levels of care. Um, and that's where, for the first time, um, I was able to experience, you know, what it's like to live with what was often very severe and debilitating OCD. Um, but more importantly, see how rewarding it was to be able to participate and, um, you know, help someone uh, in their recovery journey. Mm. Um, I'll, I'll actually never forget the the moment when uh, I was shadowing uh, another senior clinician and saw ERP, you know, live in action for the first time. And uh, as cliched as it sounds, something truly clicked for me in that moment, you know, up up until that point. um, A lot of the therapy that I've, uh, that I had read about or seen done was probably best characterized as more non-directive and non-specific. Um, and, you know, I recognize there's a place for that, um, but always thought it it was serving somewhat as a Band-Aid, you know, tiding a person over, say, until the next week. And so seeing ERP in action for the first time was actually with a with an adolescent client. Um, again, something clicked and I just came away from that observation going, wow, th- this is something that would work for this person. This is mm-hmm. something that would help them overcome this problem and live a, a you know, fulfilled life. Um, yeah. and I, I, I wanted to, uh, from that moment onward, I wanted to study, uh, and get as much experience as I could with, uh, exposure and response prevention therapy and other similar modalities. And with that adolescent, um, mm-hmm. obviously it was, I guess what, what clicked was that, well, it seems to really be changing something, but what, what was it witnessing seeing this adolescent i assume go through a decent amount of discomfort and anxiety and face their fears did anything click there around like yeah i don't want to sort of lead the question but i'll I'll leave it at that yeah yeah um 
you know, what, what was interesting about that particular observation, so the, the context for the exposure activity was the young lady was um, working on schoolwork. Um, and that was a primary trigger for her. There were lots of, you know, obsessional fears around mistakes that could be made or imperfections and the, you know, catastrophic implications that that might have. And counter to, I think, what most people expect therapy should look like, um, this clinician did a masterful job at using a balance of empathy but also not, you know, rescuing her with reassurance or, um, you know, providing a sense of safety and security. Um, again, it was far from um, callous or cruel, but uh, this therapist gave the young lady the opportunity to face uh, the the fear and the distress that she was encountering. Again, when the expectation was to complete a, a homework assignment without the usual um, assurance from a trusted adult figure that it was done properly and without mistakes. Um, and it, it struck me that of, of course she wasn't going to be feeling better in the moment. Um, if anything, it was, it was going to be more challenging for her than if the clinician had provided reassurance. Um, but what I came away with was an understanding that that was what needed to happen for her in the long run. Um, that the, the provision of reassurance, uh, was, was just another trip through the cycle. Um, that would, you know, maybe maybe work in that moment, but further kind of entrench her in the problem. Um, and so it was it was seeing that uh, that really that moment clicked for me that this is um, likely to be a challenging journey for her, um, mm-hmm. but one that will ultimately give her the opportunity to make her way out of this problem for for the long term. Yeah, that's really really fascinating. Um, mm-hmm. So today I want to ask you some questions about ERP uh, for my mm. listeners um, and okay. myself. I always want to improve and learn. So, um, uh, but but just before that, you know, you you work for work at NoCD. Um, you're yes. a therapist there. You're also clinical director of the East Region. Is that the whole of the East Coast, or? Um, yes, and actually, um, so the, <laughs> um, that uh, that title that you might have gotten from our website is is, is unfortunately outdated. Uh, thank thank you for the reminder that we've got to update our website. Uh, my my role at NoCD is uh, our our clinical director of programming and development. Okay. Um, so in that role, uh, my current responsibilities include um, overseeing our current training uh, program and model, and always looking for opportunities to refine and improve, uh, but more importantly, expanding the scope of no, uh, services that no CD can provide our members. You know, Stuart, one of the things you and I spoke about a bit here in the beginning is how um, we know comorbidity, you know, that is the, the co-occurrence of other mental health conditions is the rule, you know, rather than the exception uh, with, mm. with OCD. And, um, you know, we know that when comorbid conditions are not uh, addressed or managed effectively, they can get in the way. They can have a negative influence on ERP. They can hinder one's ability to really derive maximal benefit from the treatment. Um, so rather than, you know, just watching idly that these comorbid conditions continue to be barriers to, to getting the best treatment response, at NoCD, we are endeavoring to, um, you know, provide uh, effective concurrent treatment for individuals that are struggling with a lot of common comorbidities, you know, whether that be depression, whether that be an additional anxiety based problem, um, even other obsessive compulsive related disorders like body focus, repetitive behaviors, body dysmorphic disorder and the like. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Wow. And how, and how's that going? That whole process of figuring this out? Uh, fascinating, challenging, mm. uh, exciting. Um, I'm I'm thrilled to be part of a growing team that is truly passionate about doing this work. Um, fortunately, our therapists um, are you know excited about these developments. Even though, of course, you know it it does um, place more of a burden on us to do more training, um, <laughs> especially um, you know kind of learning learning mid flight. Um, you know, mm-hmm. therapists aren't able to just drop their clinical responsibilities. So um, they're, you know, engaged in continuous training, um, both in kind of classroom style settings, as well as doing a lot of uh, practice with the new therapy skills and modalities that they're learning about. Mm. So this is something you and NoCD are bringing in 
like the trainings. Yeah. Ex- exactly. Correct. Yep. Um, what, what we're doing is um, uh, when uh, a therapist joins our network, uh, all of our therapists receive training, what we consider to be our core conditions. These are uh, conditions that every therapist at NoCD is rigorously trained to treat. That, of course, includes OCD. Um, given the, the frequent co-occurrence of depression, it also includes depression as well as anxiety disorders. Because we know, Stuart, that when a therapist has a good, solid foundation of knowledge and confidence in using exposure and response prevention therapy for OCD, um, it, it's not too much of a stretch to uh, apply that treatment effectively to address a wider range of anxiety-based conditions like social phobia, panic disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, and the like. And so we're we're finding really good success rates, not only, of course, with addressing OCD, uh, but being able to simultaneously provide help with those other conditions. Yeah, yeah, that's fascinating. And it'll be interesting to see how, how that changes over time and the results you get. And yeah, nice. Absolutely, yeah. So, um, ERP, um, I'm always curious how therapists, um, uh, I'm going to use the word sell in ERP. And, and what I mean by that is with the client, you know, they're new to it. You know, a lot of my listeners will be pretty, whether they've done ERP or not, they'll they'll understand it quite well. Mm-hmm. Um, but for someone that, that comes to you maybe that doesn't understand it that well, how how you kind of, um, educate them on what you guys are going to be doing together. In, in particular, the, the words you use, the way you phrase it, whether you mm. get the white whiteboard out over Zoom and like draw graphs or the brain or, you know, the ABC, whatever it is. Um, just anything you want to say on any of that, how you kind of educate people. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, we certainly sing the praises of the effectiveness um, without getting too much into uh, you know, highly technical language. Uh, we make sure to convey just a, a, a very high level um, and easy to understand summary of what the large body of research literature has to say about the effectiveness of OCD. Um, and so that, you know, people can understand um, they're going to be engaging in a treatment that wasn't developed yesterday um, and has, you know, has been around for a long time and has shown reliable and and beneficial results um we we balance that kind of high level summary of research that of course you know applies to large groups of individuals by also of course without you know revealing any personal identifying information but sharing case stories you know one of the things Stuart that um uh I came to understand uh early in my career as a graduate student is that uh when we're trying to change people's attitudes. Um, Social psychologists know this, that um, not everybody responds to the same methods or or, uh, uh, persuasive appeals, if you will. Um, Some people gravitate towards those, you know, summaries of what research says about treatments that apply to large groups of people. Some people are going to be far more meaningfully influenced by um, anecdotal evidence, um, you know, a, a case story. So again, without um, ever compromising the confidentiality or identity of, of our clients, uh, we do encourage therapists to, for lack of a better term, share some of their success stories mm. um, to, to really get a client on board with understanding that you can expect uh, this is a treatment that is going to um, pay off for you in the long run. Yeah. In terms of how we help a client to really grasp you know, the, the, the theoretical underpinnings uh, of ERP and what it does. Um, I think one of the most important things we do, Stuart, is um, draw on people's personal experience because although, yes, ERP is, is more sophisticated than this, arguably every human being has undergone their own course of ERP, whether they realize it or not at some point in their lives. You know, e- ERP is not fundamentally different from how we overcome typical, you know, fears or anxieties in childhood. You know, nearly everybody can remember what it was like to try to pedal a bicycle for the first time without, you know, training wheels on, or that first time they were, you know, wanting to sweep a, a, a swim in the deep end of a swimming pool or go out, you know, maybe maybe in the ocean or the sea a bit above their head where they couldn't touch. 
um, everybody remembers, you know, what these um, natural experiences was like of having to confront a fear, not rely on, you know, some kind of safety crutch or behavior. And, you know, experiencing that initial increase uh, in anxiety or fear when we initially confront the situation, um, but then seeing that with time, with persistence, and most importantly, without, you know, avoiding or backing out of the situation, um, the, the fear dissipates and important learning comes in where we acquire new information that we previously weren't able to take in that counter to my fear, uh, I didn't sink to the bottom. Counter to my fear, I didn't crash the bike and, you know, uh, experience a serious injury. Um, or related to that, even if some negative events did occur, I fell off the bike or I got a little panicked out in the deep water. Um, we're also able to see that we learn um, we're more capable, we're more um, able to endure these kind of situations um, than we imagine at the outset. And that, um, you know, I, I think is another one of the big selling points of ERP that, you know, there, there's no 100% guarantees that bad things don't happen. Sometimes they do. Um, but that can nonetheless provide very rich opportunities to acquire a sense of, you know, ability to tolerate and uh, bear through either that type of negative experience. Yeah. Yeah. Really good point. Um, and I agree with you on the whole, I think for some people you, you, you can, and I think I'm this way inclined, you know, that with some people you can say, oh, well, there's this many RCTs, randomized control trials, there's this much effectiveness and they're like, okay, that's good, but it doesn't mean anything. Right. right and then right. you tell one success story with a past client, as you say, keeping it anonymous. And then that hits home that resonates much harder. Um, Absolutely. Humans are influenced by stories, right? And a randomized control trial is not really a story um, or not, not a good at all. One. Yeah, not at all. And, you know, I've, I've, I've experienced that before and had people politely tell me, well, that's, that's nice, but I'm, I'm sure I'm in the minority there. Um, I'm hearing you say that although there's a high success rate, it's not a hundred percent success rate. And I firmly believe, uh, I'm in that latter group that, um, may not benefit from this at all. I may be beyond help. And so couldn't agree with you more, Stuart, that being able to really, you know, bring, bring a face and bring to life, you know, what the experience can be like of confronting fears, um, abandoning compulsions and really taking back one's life, uh, that, that seems to be, arguably just as influential as any any you know intricate summary of literature yeah really good point i guess the risk comes though when there's the really tasty stories but there's not then the harder science to back up those stories mm. that's when people can get in trouble uh not always because it might just be that nothing's been really trialed at an rct level um, mm. and maybe those stories are accurate but you could find a story for almost anything so it's it's being careful there um so uh hierarchy so obviously it might be a bit different when you work through no cd versus maybe mm. when you've worked face to face historically so maybe you could answer from both perspectives but i'm just always curious how therapists are uh working collaboratively collaboratively with their clients to create a hierarchy and make that process one kind of interesting and two um that we're getting enough good stuff Good ideas. Yeah, sure. I, lo I love some of the, the words you're using there, Stuart. What stood out to me when you asked the question was your use of the word collaboratively. That is something that we stress uh, to the greatest degree that we can, that the, the process of creating a hierarchy ought to be collaborative. Um, what I always say to our therapists in training and developmental contexts is if the hierarchy feels like a one-way conversation or a guessing game where it's just you proposing ideas to your client, throwing stuff at the wall to see what sticks. Um, that really isn't what we want the process to look like. It should be one that is very collaborative that I'm not saying that the therapist can never propose ideas, but in an ideal sense, we're hopeful that there's just, there's just as many ideas that are going to be proposed from the client. Mm -hmm. And that gets at my next point that it's really the client's personal experience, you know, living with the symptoms and being able to recognize the day-to-day -day 
triggers, you know, that they continuously confront that are the best exposure stimuli. One of the things, Stuart, that anybody's ever trained with me could tell you that I, I truly beat, um, <laughs> beat like a dead horse is it's, it's not enough to simply know what one fears to create a hierarchy. If I have a client that tells me, um, I'm afraid that I might vomit, um, that's a nice start in the hierarchy building process, but it's far from the totality of the information that I need, I think, to be able to build an effective hierarchy with that person. Um, in order to do that, I need to know, okay, what are these specific stimuli? What are the scenarios? What are the places? What are the things that you confront that evoke this kind of fear? Um, and also, what is it about that feared consequence? What is about that outcome, if it were to happen, um, that would you know, be so bothersome? While, while trying not, certainly not to be insensitive or minimize a person's concerns, mm -hmm. um, the answer to that question is often a very important telltale indicator in where exposure needs to go. You know, for example, if the client were to say, I'm worried that if I start to vomit, it'll become uncontrollable and I'll never stop. I'll just be this, you know, continuous puking machine. I'm probably going to develop a hierarchy in collaboration with that client that looks very different from the client who says, you know, Nick, what I fear the most is just the intense social humiliation that would come if I were to unexpectedly have a vomiting experience in front of other people, you know, whether that be people that uh, are nearest and dearest to me or people that are complete strangers. Um, it's, it just gets at the, the highly idiosyncratic nature uh, of obsessional fears in OCD and subsequently the need to develop a very personalized hierarchy. Yeah, that's a really good point. So, you know, with that example, the the client of emetophobia, that's it's a more social fear. Mm. And you might say, well, when I eat muffins, I feel like I'm going to be sick. Okay, so let's mm. try and eat a muffin in a cafe with people right. around. Whereas with the other person, the muffin might still do it, but the cafe offers no extra stimuli because they don't care if people see. Exactly, exactly. And, with you know, without that information, um, with with knowing only that, okay, muffins are a trigger for this client, thus I will propose eating muffins as an exposure, which is you know, certainly reasonable. But if the therapist has not carefully taken the time to understand, you know, what the what the client's feared consequence is there, that may ultimately lead to, you know, an exposure activity or task that's wide of the mark. You know, we'll mm -hmm. we'll eat muffins here in the safety of the therapy office, or even, you know, we we do what we do our teletherapy one hundred percent virtually. But um, the the real stimulus that's needed there beyond the muffin is an audience, if you will, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, somebody uh, to to be around that could presumably uh, observe this this vomiting experience. Um, and so without recognition that what this client ultimately fears is a vomiting episode in front of another person or, or a group of people, um, ultimately that person's exposure journey may only go so far. Good point. Yeah, really good point. Um, okay. And then I, I want to ask about homework because that, that's such a key part for ERP, right? If, you know, see with the, cli the clients I have that when they don't do their homework, Therapy takes a hell of a lot, lot longer mm. than because obviously we're only with them for an hour a week and they've got however many hours are in a week. I'm not quite sure, 100 and something. Um, right. Obviously, they're sleeping some of that, hopefully. But uh, <laughs> so I guess um, before I talk about sort of adherence to homework, which I guess I've already started, but just more when you set homework, it's obviously going to massively depend on the client you have and the stage they're at and do you have any sort of general rules of do you try and make homework fit in their life in the way it maybe doesn't last too long or does that not matter? Is it more? Mm. Yeah. Just what, what variables do you consider when setting homework with someone? Um, well, one of the things that comes up often in a training perspective, Stuart, is we, we discourage the use of the term assigning. Um, and I, I, I know it's a term that's been around for quite some time in the in the ERP field, but it, it again mm. suggests that as the therapist, I am giving a directive to you, the client, maybe without 
much understanding of just how on board you are with that expectation that I'm setting. Mm -hmm. So for that reason, again, I'm going to, I'm going (laughs) to emphasize the collaborative nature of this. Um, Arguably the homework expectations that are set or the decisions that are made about what the homework will be is, is best done with the client having a strong ownership stake in that process. Um, Ideally, what I think that looks like is the therapist and client looking at the hierarchy simultaneously and the therapist asking some sort of question along the lines of what are you willing to take on this week or based on, you know, upcoming events in your life or really where you want to see some relief from symptoms, what, where, what do you imagine you're you know most capable and willing to take on this week? Um, and, you know, I'm going to pay homage to my social psychology colleagues because we know that when people have a stake in a decision, they they tend to engage more in, in following yeah. through with it. Um, when there's, you know, a sense of agency in the process rather than being told what to do, uh, this increases the likelihood of a person following through and, and uh, meeting the intention. So I, th- I think that's very important. Um, yeah. I think um, pre preemptively, it's critically important to have conversations with a client up front uh, about the necessity of homework, again, without getting too much into <laughs> boring research summaries. Um, but, you know, we we do want to explain to clients that in no uncertain terms, um, home, homework, homework follow through is an incredibly strong predictor of treatment success. Um, it, to, to the best of my knowledge, there is maybe no single more important factor that predicts uh, eventual treatment outcome uh, as, mm-hmm. as well as you know, retention of those gains over the long run. And so, you know, we, we have that conversation with the client up front so that, you know, the, the expectation is kind of set from day one that it will be important for them to follow through uh, between sessions with, with homework expectations. And, you know, Stuart, I, I like a point that you alluded to that um, how can we make it more convenient for the client? Um, mm-hmm. It's It's not always convenient to have to, set aside an hour or more a day where I'm interrupting life, you know, whether that's work, whether that's social recreational activities, family stuff, uh, to, to focus exclusively on homework. Um, now, you know, there's, there's a time and place for that. Um, and and certainly it needs to happen at times. Um, but the, the point that you made that I think is really critical here is how can we work in tandem with the client to build ERP tasks and activities that can kind of seamlessly be integrated into one's lifestyle. You know, if if one was already going to be um, taking public transit to work, how can we, you know, craft an exposure task that is taken along for the ride, so to speak? Mm. Really good point. Yeah, really good points. Um, yeah. Yeah, I agree. It's interesting. Uh, um, yeah, I, I agree with you. I think homework is in, a crucial part of uh, of the process. Um, mm. I guess I'm realizing I I don't labor that point early enough. Of homework is going to be a key part of this this therapy, and it, mm. you know you'll see better results if you do it. I'm not gonna Absolutely. I'm not gonna complain too much if you don't, but I will keep nagging. Um, you know, I'm not gonna yeah. So okay, so. Um, with your clients that really take to ERP, you know, the mm. ones that seem to just hit the ground running. Yes. What do you notice about them? Mm. Love that question. Um, I think, Stuart, the biggest thing I notice is an adoption of, of ERP as more of a lifestyle change than, than, than simply, you know, a sporadic thing that is done here and there, but when it's over, it's kind of a return to life as I, as I knew it a few hours ago. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that I try to help clients and therapists alike understand is that ERP, 
when done best is not something where we just, you know, put our ERP hat on for an hour or two a day and go, okay, during this time, I'm going to face the fear and uh, prevent the the usual compulsion or safety behavior that I might use. Um, but then when it's, when it's done, off the hat goes and it's, uh, mm-hmm. you know, <laughs> back to avoidance and compulsions and safety behaviors. So to, to answer your question, um, I I feel the most warm and fuzzy from a prognostic standpoint when I see clients not only following through with the planned, you know, ERP activities that we mm-hmm. collaboratively agree on in sessions, but also taking advantage of spontaneous opportunities that come along. Um, mm-hmm. Life has a great way of throwing us curveballs uh, of, you know, uh, giving us opportunities with unexpected triggers or feared cues that come up throughout our day and the the clients again that i feel the most prognostically optimistic about are the ones who from the early going are kind of on the lookout for those opportunities um, and taking advantage of them as an opportunity to almost treat it as though it were a planned erp Mm -hmm. um and kind of uh you know almost approaching life each day with this newfound mindset of, okay, OCD, give me your best shot. Um, rather than being on the defensive, I'm going to go on the offensive. I'm going to look for opportunities in my different day-to-day experiences to, to confront triggers and prevent compulsions where ordinarily I might engage in them. Um, I yeah. sometimes use the description of, you know, when you're getting on, on the bus, let's, let's deliberately seek out the most challenging seat. Yeah. Really good point. Yeah, and of course, that's showing the brain or the part of the brain where OCD lives that uh, obviously there's many parts of the brain involved in OCD, but generally speaking, um, it shows that part. um, I can handle this. I can tolerate it. And then if you can handle it and tolerate it, that part of your brain goes, okay, maybe you don't need to be so worried about this. I'll stop sending you these signals. And then OCD Mm. starts to reduce. Um, Yeah. Whereas, yeah, that's... yeah. I like that. Yeah, like a way of life as opposed to just a therapy. Well, and, and of course, Stuart, if, if we want these skills to translate to real life, for lack of a better term, arguably it's those spontaneous exposures that are the more closer approximations of real life. You know, some sometimes I think the 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 dangers of uh, ERP only occurring under planned, highly predictable settings is that sometimes these are these are not the best simulations of life, uh, and there may be limitations then in the extent to which skills and knowledge transfer to real life day to day scenarios. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah I guess you know, you could... one yeah, thing in a kind of a, a contrived sense to say, okay my ERP homework for the day is to go to the kitchen and to grab a knife and to allow those um, disturbing thoughts about harming my family. Um, that's that's certainly a good start. That sounds like an important situation that that person needs to confront, um, but, but quite different from how that person is probably going about just natural day-to-day living experiences. Um, mm-hmm. What is that person to do when you know, unexpectedly, there's a knife right there in front of them. Maybe they're at a birthday uh, celebration and the person who's cutting the cake says, here, here you go. Uh, <laughs> you're go now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, cut the cake. Mm. Um, yeah, that's a good point. I guess what came to my mind, the vision of like samurai warriors for some reason, but thinking about them like ERP is like them in training. It mm. might be scary in training because you're fighting with wooden sticks and you get hit and it hurts like hell and um you know and there's you're doing different drills and whatever and it's hard it's arduous you physical training but then you go out in the real world of ERP and it's like going into battle it's it's mm-hmm. not I don't always like comparing OCD to a war but just that's what came in terms of ERP is going to work but it needs to be done in the battle not just in the training area Love that analogy. If, uh, with your permission, I'd like to steal that. Yeah, take it. Yeah, <laughs> go for it. Yeah, no worries. Um, so, uh, I had a, I, I wrote a kind of flip side question to the one I just asked you because obviously sure. there, there's times where it's not going to be quite simple that people can kind of 
well, maybe they they can, but it's things are going to get in the way. And especially as you know, at the start, you mentioned comorbidities. So I guess I just wanted to ask the flip side of that: of what, when, and what are the blocks um, that get in people's way to really like going after ERP? Mm. Um, well, you know, uh, again, you you've mentioned comorbidities, and and certainly. Um, some of the symptoms of those, especially, you know, at more severe levels, uh, mm. we find to be very common obstacles to engaging with ERP. Um, whether that's the challenges with, um, you know, mustering up the necessary energy levels and motivation to follow through with ERP that often comes with uh, depressive disorders or mood-related conditions. Um, sometimes there can be fear and anxiety based symptoms from you know concurrent anxiety disorders that also act as direct obstacles you know imagine the person that's struggling not only with ocd but social phobia for example um that person understandably may have a very difficult time engaging in erp where they're in a any kind of social context or where there's social interaction involved in the nature of the exposure um this is why we find it's important in many cases to uh, address the symptoms of two or more conditions concurrently. And it's you know certainly a, a few more balls to juggle in the process and can um, realistically make for a, a somewhat longer course of treatment. Um, but we, we think that that's um, going to be a better experience in the long run um, rather than leaving those comorbidities unaddressed and, and having them continue to, you know, kind of infringe on the ERP experience. Yeah. Um, what else comes to mind? You know, um, certainly um, life can get in the way. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, understandably, there are competing priorities for many of the clients we serve through no CD, um, whether that's work obligations, um, familial obligations, um, yeah, uh, di different different uh, competing priorities, um, and so oftentimes I, I think it is necessary to have polite yet candid uh, discussions with with clients about ways that we can at least in a temporary sense um, make ERP a priority, um, mm -hmm. and really trying to get the client and oftentimes you know the the family and the close support system of the client all on board with the notion that we've got to invest in some inconvenience now mm. for the sake of making life much more convenient and enjoyable in a longer term. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Um, so when my last sort of question on the RP is, is as a therapist, and I guess I'm asking this for any therapist listening and also, um, non-therapist listening that, mm. um, because sometimes, you know, I hear people are afraid to start ERP because they feel the therapist is going to push them too hard or not be compassionate enough. And obviously, most therapists are compassionate. Mm. Um, if they're not, probably find a new therapist. That's that's like that's <laughs> one of the, the 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 minimums for being a therapist. Um, but also, um, yeah, some therapists will push harder in ERP, obviously, and and some mm -hmm. will will go much slower and it's going to depend on how much money someone wants to spend on therapy how much time someone has you know is there other mm -hmm. stuff going on that you want to work on but i guess for you um knowing when to push and when to leave the exposure where it's at like mm -hmm. yeah um hmm. well one of the things that I explain to all my clients and encourage the therapist that I train to do the same is really clarifying what our role is at therapists. That mm -hmm. at times it will be important for us to gently nudge the client to um, be outside of their comfort zone. Um, so the the kind of phrase I use is I'm I'm I will challenge you, I will never force you. Um, so let, letting them know it's always going to come across as suggestions or ideas that we hope at a minimum are, are given consideration rather than mandates or, mm -hmm. you know, to, to, um, be cooperative, you must meet this expectation. 
um yeah 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 good yeah, point I, you know, I it Stuart when you when you were asking this question um one of the things that came to mind is not only the trepidation that you know um clients experience on some level about beginning the ERP process I think an underappreciated aspect of ERP is the trepidation that clinicians ourselves experience. Hmm. Um, uh, I was fortunate enough in, in my graduate school training to develop a program of research around the role of therapists' own anxieties and the negative impact that that can have on therapeutic process and outcomes uh, when, when, when using an exposure-based treatment. Um, there's actually, it's fascinating, some... Some uh, very interesting research that was done in Germany where um, biological measures of anxiety and distress were taken simultaneously amongst clients beginning exposure therapy, but novice therapists as well. Mm. And using those biological indices of anxiety, the two groups were indistinguishable from each other. That is to say, <laughs> therapists who are just uh, getting getting their sea legs, so to speak, with exposure therapy are coming into sessions just as nervous uh, as the clients themselves who are going to be doing exposure. Um, so we we have um, developed and tested some innovative training methods to help therapists, you know, not only understand the ins and outs uh, of ERP, but specific methodologies to also build their confidence, to help them overcome their own anxieties and understand that it's very unlikely, or at least a lot less probable than you might anticipate that there will be, you know, serious negative consequences associated with exposure. Your your clients are not going to shatter like spun glass. Um, your clients are not going to run out of the office screaming, uh, and there's going to be massive damage done to the therapeutic relationship. Again, we, we don't dismiss these things as impossibilities, um, but try to help the therapist understand that with, you know, reasonable, proper precautions, uh, the likelihood of these anticipated negative outcomes is considerably minimized. Mm. Yeah, really good point. Um, yeah, it is. It is. It's tough being a therapist doing doing ERP mm. because you don't want to see people go through discomfort. It's nice to see them face their fears because that's a really inspiring thing to witness and and help them learn that they can do sort of brave things. Um, but yeah, it's not it's not comfortable for the therapist in any means. No, yeah. certainly not. I I think for most of us who, you know, had some exposure to Hollywood depictions of what psychotherapy looks like, even before any kind of professional training, understandably came away from that experience with notions that uh, here's what therapy will look like. The client will walk into my office in a state of distress. Uh, I'm going to say and do all these magical things, and that will result in them leaving my office in a much, much lower state of distress in a place of tranquility. And so, you know, when we first learn about what this this thing called ERP is and what it involves, it kind of defies, right, some of those uh, expectations about what the therapeutic process ought to look like. Yeah, yeah that's a really good point. Um, so uh, you can pick up the phone and call the 20-year-old Nick. What would you tell him? <laughs> uh, oh, well, uh, among many other things. Um, uh, wow. So first, um, be open minded to where your career will take you. Uh, and don't don't limit yourself to just those professional opportunities or endeavors that you feel um, sufficiently prepared for. Um, in, in my role at no CD, one of the things that has been equal parts challenging and exciting is being given responsibilities and asked to work on initiatives that frankly, I look back at years and years of graduate school preparation and postgraduate training and go, wow, no nothing prepared me for this. Um, and, and rather than so <laughs> to answer your question, what I would tell 20 year old Nick is um, uh, it's, it's okay. It's, it's okay to feel uh, anxious. It's okay to feel um, a sense of, you know, being a bit lost and unsure um, because, because there hasn't been the requisite, you know, training and preparation for this. 
uh, but nonetheless to approach it with a sense of open mindedness as and an opportunity for professional growth. Yeah, yeah, really good point. It was, um, I guess, comparatively early in my career, easy to say, well, uh, I don't think I'm best suited for this responsibility because I don't remember taking a graduate course. So I don't remember any postgraduate training or experience in this area. Yeah, you know, mm-hmm. I, I can't be asked with balancing a budget. I didn't, I didn't you know, major in finance. <laughs> yeah, good example. Um, so you've also got a billboard where you live. What do you want written on that billboard? Oh, well, funny you mentioned that. There's a there's a very popular billboard in my neck of the woods in Wisconsin that actually has a face that looks like mine. Bald head, large beard. Uh, it's a it's a very prolific attorney. So. So my colleagues at NoCD playfully uh, poke fun that that's me on that billboard. But uh, ooh, um, what do I want my billboard to say? Is that the question, Stuart? Just yeah. want to make sure I've got it right. Yeah. yeah. Could be a picture as well. It doesn't have to be words. <laughs> um, hmm. I've never been asked that. I've, I've, I've been asked more often about the, the tombstone or the epitaph or whatever. Mm. <laughs> uh, billboard. Um, well, I, I, you know, believe passionately and wholeheartedly in No City's mission. So uh, I, I would want the, you know, pioneering work that we're doing to be featured on that billboard. And, you know, one of the things I'll, I'll admit, I have been jealous for years um, at the marketing clout uh, of the pharmaceutical industry, not only here in the United States, but, you know, equally around the world. And so I would want, that billboard to be predicated on make you know just raising awareness that mm. good evidence-based help is available uh, literally at your fingertips um mm. you know we're we're finding increasing success when we look at the um effectiveness rates of treatment for ocd that's uh, that's delivered in a virtual capacity um, and that that speaks to me on a personal level, Stuart, because I grew up um, in a in a very rural region of the United States where um, my my hometown had approximately five thousand people. Um, I honestly don't know if there was even one single mental health professional, but if there was, I imagine that person serviced the entire you know the entire small city, um, meaning access to specialty care like ERP for OCD was a pipe dream. Um, and so I, I think of the people, you know, that, that I grew up with, that I went to school with, that I worked with during the first 18 years of my life. And, you know, knowing it was a fact that there were people suffering, uh, in silence and not knowing, first of all, what this thing that they were dealing with was even called, um, but that there was, you know, a, a highly effective treatment option to find their way out of that hell, um, that that I think would be critical. So sorry, that's a very long-winded way of <laughs> answering your question. That uh, to summarize, I would want my billboard to raise awareness um, that you know uh, effective care is is available for for folks who need it. Yeah, yeah, it's an important message that needs to get out there. Um, and you mentioned your tombstone there. What would you have written on it? <laughs> Uh, what would I have written on it? Um, I, I, I realize I'm, I'm speaking about this, um, a lot in a professional capacity, and that is an important aspect of my life, but I, I do certainly want to, um, you know, emphasize, uh, I, I hope a big part of my epitaph would be, uh, the, the love, uh, that I have for my family, uh, and my friends, um, and that, uh, I was always passionate, no matter how hard I worked, but making a space for the things I love most. Um, but in a, in a professional sense, I would hope I would be remembered as someone who um, worked, you know, tirelessly to um, make evidence-based treatment for OCD and related conditions more effective, uh, more accessible, and um, even more affordable. Mm, brilliant. Nice. Uh, and then, uh, lastly, anything else you wish you could have said or shared today? Mm-hmm. Well, I, I don't think so. We, we've we've covered a lot of territory, and I again really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. Yeah, look, thank you so much for coming on. And obviously, it was super early when we started this. It was dark <laughs> in your room, and it's, it's right. now it's now light. So, 
um, <laughs> sun coming up here exactly yeah so thank you for getting up early and just sharing your your wisdom it was really really great to hear it um and yeah the pleasure was all mine Stuart. thank you for having me thank you for listening to this week's podcast and thank you to our patreons who helped make this episode possible and if you would like to find out more about patreon and the rewards and benefits then there will be a link in the episode description. If you enjoy the OCD Stories podcast and would like to support us, please subscribe and rate the show wherever you listen to the podcast. And thank you to NoCD for supporting our work. If you want to find out more about NoCD, head to go.treatmyocd.com forward slash the OCD stories or click the link in the episode description. And quick disclaimer, guys, this podcast is not therapy. It is not a replacement for therapy. Please seek treatment from a trained professional. And until we speak... Take care.